This is the complete backend developer roadmap for 2025. It's a clear and actionable path to master backend development. We'll cover everything from programming languages to databases, APIs, and also advanced topics to help you stand out among other developers. And a quick note to make this even easier for you, I've created a free roadmap template to track your progress along with project suggestions to practice these skills. You can grab your copy from the description below. Let's start with the foundational tools and technologies that you need to learn, and it all starts by understanding how the internet works. For the timeline of this, you need to spend around a week here to learn about DNS, things like what DNS is, and understand the basics of IP addressing, and how domain names resolve to IP addresses. Then you need to learn about the HTTP, which is the protocol behind the web communication, and also the secure connections using HTTPS. Next topic after HTTPS is web servers, which are servers that work on top of this HTTP protocol, so things like how these servers handle requests and responses, and also about the client-server model, so how client applications communicate with those web servers using the HTTP protocol. After that, you need to do a quick workspace setup, meaning a code editor that you will use to start coding, and here we have options like VS Code, WebStorm or Sublime Text. If you're not sure which one to choose, I recommend you start with VS Code because it's free and it's also the most popular and it's easy to understand for beginners. And we also have some AI code editors. So if you choose to go with AI code editors, then I recommend Cursor AI or Windsurf. And whichever code editor you choose, just make sure to install the extensions that will speed up your development, things like Prettier, Auto Importer, Spell Checker or Live Server. These are things that will enhance your productivity while working in this code editor. And after this step, you can get started with learning one of the programming languages in the backend. You need to pick one language from here and dive deeper into that. As you can see, we have many options like Python, Node.js, Java, C Sharp, Go, Kotlin, and we have so many more. None of these languages is the best. Each has its own pros and cons, so you need to focus on mastering one deeply instead of learning several on a surface level. If you're not sure which one to choose, I also have the Stack Overflow survey here which is the survey for the previous year. As you can see among all professional developers and also those who are learning to code, the most popular languages are JavaScript and also Python, which means that they are in very high demand compared to other languages out there. I recommend focusing on Python or Node.js, and if you want my recommendation between those two, then I recommend starting with Node.js, because you also learn the JavaScript language, which you can use later to become a full-stack developer. Within Node.js, the essential topics that you need to learn are NPM, which is the Nodes Package Manager. This will help you to install and manage the dependencies in your Node application. Then it starts with the Node.js basics, which are the event loop architecture and asynchronous programming, which is very commonly used in Node.js applications. You'll also need to learn about modules, things like how to import and export modules, with things like CommonJS, which is the old way of using modules, and also the ES modules, which is the newer way, and it's also commonly used with TypeScript applications. Another common topic is file system in Node.js, things like working with streams for efficient file handling, and also the FS module, which is the file system module that allows you to read and write and manage files within the application. One of the common topics in Node.js is middlewares, and these are used in all of the Node.js applications. There are some popular middlewares like body parser, course, and helmet, but you need to also learn to write your own custom middleware for logging, authentication, and validation. Then, like in any other application, you need to learn how to handle the errors in Node.js applications, both synchronous and asynchronous errors. And here is, for example, a good opportunity to use the middleware to write your own custom middleware, which will be the error handler. And if you're going to build real-world applications with Node.js, then you need to choose a framework, because it's very rare that you have a pure Node.js application for production. Some of the common frameworks are Nest.js, which uses TypeScript, and also Express.js. Out of these two, Express.js is the most popular framework, and it's widely used in companies who are hiring Node.js developers. But Nest.js is a good alternative for those companies who prefer to write their code in TypeScript. 
And learning your first programming language will take you somewhere around one month because you need to master all of these essentials. But if you want to go the extra mile and learn some bonus points, then you can learn about the linters and formatters, which are things like Prettier and setting up ESLint to make sure that your code is clean and error prone. You can learn about module bundlers like Vite and Webpack, which help you to optimize your code for the production. Another common topic is memory leaks, which is not exclusive to Node.js applications, but overall to JavaScript applications. And this is also a common interview question. You can also learn the debugger mode in your code editor. Whichever you choose, like WebStorm or VS Code, you can learn the debugger mode to help you debug your own Node.js applications. And also regarding the security, you can learn how to manage the config management, be it packages like .env and how to access these variables using the process .env. Some of the tech companies also prefer to use TypeScript instead of JavaScript because it adds type safety and reduces runtime errors. And it's common to use this with Node.js applications. For example, if you choose to go with Nest.js framework, it comes with TypeScript out of the box. And otherwise, if you choose to go with Express.js, you can still set up your project in TypeScript. And you might encounter some projects that require TypeScript. And to understand why we even have TypeScript, it's good to learn about the statically versus dynamically typed languages, which basically means TypeScript versus JavaScript and how they are different. Within TypeScript, you need to learn about types and interfaces that help us define the interface of our objects or types of our variables. There are some common utility types that are used often in TypeScript like omit, record and so on. And within TypeScript, it's also a good opportunity to learn about object-oriented versus functional programming because it makes more sense to learn this when you learn about the statically typed language. And lastly, we have generics and decorators here. Generics are more commonly used to define a generic type in TypeScript, but we also have decorators which you can learn and it also might come up during the interviews. And if you decide to learn those bonus points in Node.js, then it might take you extra 2 to 4 weeks to learn all of this. And after learning your first programming language, you can also learn about version control, which will help you to track changes in your code and also collaborate with other developers. Here you need to learn git for version control and key commands like commit, push, pull, merge and so on and also understand how to resolve merge conflicts. And you will also need one repo hosting service like GitHub to set up repositories for collaboration. And there are alternatives to this like GitLab, Bitbucket and so on but GitHub is the most commonly used among developers. And while working with your backend programming language you also need to choose one of the databases to use. Here we again have the last year's Stack Overflow survey and as you can see PostgreSQL and MySQL are the most commonly used databases and these are the SQL type of databases. And among the NoSQL databases the most commonly used one is MongoDB and after that we have Redis here. I recommend you learn about relational and non-relational databases. We also have graph and vector databases which are commonly used for social networks and also vector databases are commonly used with AI softwares. But as a starting point I recommend learning one relational database and as you saw PostgreSQL is the most commonly used one right now but MySQL is also a good option. And from non-SQL databases we have MongoDB and also Redis. Redis is an in-memory database, which means that it's not persistent, so MongoDB is a good choice here to learn as a first NoSQL database. But if you want to explore more, then the next one that I would recommend is to learn about Redis and how to use it for caching and improving the performance of your backend. You can practice building CRUD operations and handling queries and CRUD here stands for Create, Read, Update and Delete operations. You can learn how to do this in your PostgreSQL or MongoDB database. And also by knowing both of these you will understand when to use non-relational database like MongoDB and when to use relational database like MySQL. Learning the basics of each of these databases will take you around 4 weeks. And if you want to earn some bonus points for it, you can also learn about the ORMs, which is a software designed to help you interact with relational databases. You can also learn the ACID properties of SQL databases and the transactional approach. Then we have indexing, which help us to optimize the queries and make our queries more efficient. 
you can learn about database migrations and also normalization, which is a database design principle for organizing your data in a consistent way in your SQL database. After learning one relational and one non-relational database, you can move on to learning about APIs, meaning learn how to design, build and also consume APIs. Here we have three common options, REST APIs, which are the most common type of APIs, and they are also beginner friendly, so you can start here and focus on HTTP methods like GET, POST, PUT and DELETE. You will also learn about status codes and response structures here. And while learning your first programming language, you would likely build a REST API, but coming back here, you can learn about the different types and also go more in-depth about status codes, response structures and methods that you can use in these APIs. Next, we have GraphQL, which is ideal for fetching only the data that you need. Here, you will learn about queries, mutations and schema design. As an alternative, there is gRPC, which is useful for high-performance and distributed systems, but it's nowhere as popular as REST and GraphQL APIs, so my recommendation is to just be familiar with those two types of APIs, and just be aware that there are some other types of APIs, but these are the most commonly used ones. Here you would likely need 3 to 4 weeks to learn about these different types of APIs and also build one example REST API and one example GraphQL API. If you would like to also learn about API security, you can learn about CORS, which stands for Cross Origin Resource Sharing, and you will also understand how policies and configurations work in these APIs. Then for securing data in transit, you can use HTTPS and for that you will need SSL or TLS certificates to use to make your API more secure. You can also encrypt and decrypt your data for more secure transactions using packages like bcrypt. And you can also implement some of the common protections like CSRF tokens and input sanitization for XSS protection. Another common topic is rate limiting in APIs. This is a method to prevent brute force attacks using tools like Redis. You can learn about secure headers and also add some secure headers to your API like content security policy or strict transport security and so on. And lastly in the security topics we have server hardening which means to keep dependencies updated all the time and use security focused tools and also scan and monitor vulnerabilities in your code and dependencies using tools like Snyk. And also, these APIs can be in different protocols, so you can learn about the API protocols. The one that you will already be familiar with is HTTP and HTTPS, which is the most common one. But you can also learn about WebSockets, which will allow you to add real-time communication, like build a chat app. And also, as you saw, we have gRPC APIs, and they are built on top of gRPC protocol. And for server push notifications, you can also learn about SSE, which stands for Server Send Events. Out of this, these two are probably the most important ones, so if you're going to focus on one or two of these, then learn about HTTP and WebSockets. And since at this point you already know about HTTP, then learning WebSockets should take you around a week to learn about this new protocol and also how to build real-time communication. Another common topic in APIs is how you authenticate and authorize users. And there are different methods here like GVT, which is JSON Web Tokens, or OAuth. You can build a basic authentication or bearer authentication with tokens, and we also have cookie-based authentication here. You can practice implementing this in your small API projects and learn how to implement GVT for example because it's one of the most common ones and also what are the differences between basic and bearer authentication and it's good to be aware about the cookie based authentication which also is used in some applications. If you'd like to learn some bonus points with authentication then explore social logins which is how you set up a sign up and sign in with tools like Google, Facebook or other social applications. And you can also learn about managed authentication services. There are some services that do all the heavy lifting for you, like Auth0 or AWS Cognito. And in total, you'll need to spend around 2 to 3 weeks here to learn about these authentication methods, meaning the most common ones, and also implement those in your small projects. And the last topic that we have after this is learning how to deploy your APIs to some web servers. It's common nowadays to containerize your application and deploy it using Docker. 
Here you can learn about how to create Docker files and manage containers and use Docker Compose for multi-container setups. You can learn how to configure your own servers using tools like Nginx or Apache. For example, you can set up Nginx as a reverse proxy and load balancer and you can set up Apache as an HTTP server. And on the other hand, we have platforms that manage this for you. So if you'd like to not go into details of configuring your own web servers, then you can learn how to host your websites on AWS, DigitalOcean or Heroku. And here again, I think three to four weeks is enough to learn about these deployment methods and to containerize your application and deploy to one of these managed hostings or to set up your own web server. And as some bonus points here, you can learn about the performance and optimizing the performance of your APIs. For example, you can learn how to use API caching with an in-memory database, things like Redis that we talked about, or Memcached, which is the alternative to Redis. You can implement load balancing using tools like AJProxy or cloud-based services to distribute your traffic evenly among multiple API servers. And also about CDNs, which is another way to improve the performance by distributing your static files to content delivery networks. And that was the last topic here. By the end of this roadmap, you'll have the skills needed to build and deploy scalable backend systems and also stand out in job applications. And to answer the question, how long does it take to become a backend developer? This also depends how much time you will dedicate daily or weekly to learning these skills. But if you're consistent and can dedicate, let's say, 20 hours per week, then you should be proficient in about 8 to 12 months after learning this from scratch. The key is to learn consistently and also practice by doing some practice projects. And if you'd like suggestions on which projects to build to practice each of these skills, then be sure to check out the description to grab your free copy of the PDF and also the roadmap.